Hello everyone, welcome to the Shroud Podcast. I'm your host Ross Baxter and today is episode number 54 of the series. And before we even get into the podcast for episode 54, the one thing I want to talk to you about is our sponsor. So the Rookies Award is the official sponsor for the Shroud Podcast. It's so amazing how these guys are on. And with that said, I want to talk about the website, what the website has to offer. And let's just get straight into the video and, and enjoy and enjoy the show. Thanks for now. And uh, with that said, they have an amazing website um, offered uh, to everyone who is an artist, an aspiring artist trying to get into the game and film industries. Um, they even cover areas outside of games and films, such as architecture, you name it. The, the Rookies Award basically covers it. Um, the main page as well for when it comes to the Rookies Award is the actually about section. And this whole area, all the way down, all the way to the bottom, covers so many different things. But the Rookies Award has so many things um, to offer you that you've got to take advantage of. And especially when it came to my career as an artist, there were so many things I was able to dive into through the Rookies Award, such as the competition, such as exploring um, other artists' work, and most importantly, the level of other uh, artists' work, because they have so much things to offer. And as you continue scrolling down, um, obviously talking about art, showcasing your portfolio, another amazing uh, uh, aspect of the website. So you can see examples, you can tell the level of quality that people are submitting and taking part and using this as their website and also as their main area of portfolio. So obviously once you want to check other people's work, all you have to do is see examples. So this is probably one of my favorite parts about the website and the fact that it's broken down so well. Um, like obviously there's so many portfolio websites out there. It's hard to obviously make your, um, make your name notice and so forth. But when it comes to the Rookies Award, I think they've done it the best way. It not only showcases work at such a high standard, but it also shows the range. So it shows the range of students, the range of artists taking part. And as you can see, as I'm scrolling down, you can see that there's all different levels of art pieces submitted. And the reason why this is important is it shows it showcases your skill set in comparison to other people in the industry. And most importantly, other students, which is inevitably the people that you're going to be going up against for jobs, etc. So as you can see, all levels, so that's merging all of them together. But if you want to go check uh, all the different sections, so these are all the different ranking systems wh uh, when it comes to the actual competition itself. So obviously debut, you can check out um, some of the debut artists, so the people who have just, um, I guess, just started out and just found a passion for uh, for art, etc. And you can tell even uh, some of the early pieces that some people have submitted for debut is still really good. And it's that um, ranking system that we naturally have to relate ourselves to because um, in terms of trying to get jobs, we have to know the truth and find out um, where we stand in terms of our competition. And like, check out this one. This is so awesome. Like, I love this piece. I uh, just saw this now. Uh, a king of the Iron Forge, so realistic. And you can tell that this person is already hireable um, based on their skill set just alone. So. Once again, this is another great tool that the Rookies Award has to offer, checking out different skill sets, trying to figure out where you lie in the industry in terms of your competition. And speaking of the competitions and trying to get that job and make that leap, grow as an artist. So everyone needs a little challenge to push their skills. Come and join one of our contests and collect badges to share on your free portfolio page. We have huge annual, annual contests and even small monthly jams and prizes, lots of prizes. And with this, um, every time you select it so at the moment i'm pretty sure it's a summer competition that's going on at the moment and um, as you can tell summer photorealism but once you select this it takes you straight into the competition and you can learn more about the submission and most importantly learn how to improve as you can tell and um, as i'm recording this this um this podcast the submission is actually tomorrow and um, so 12 hours and 53 minutes to go so you're setting the deadline and so forth once again another great source of material for you to utilize on the website. Right, this is the thing um, of the website I think that highlights why the Rookies Award is so strong and why I highly recommend for you guys to check out the website. And it's these f um, four main kind of ranking badges that your final portfolio submission, once you actually take part in the competition, help, well, first of all, it just hi um, highlights your skill set and where you're at. And it gives you great feedback um, from people who are already in the industry and for example, one of the judges who does the critique of the portfolio, um, who's taken part in the past, was actually one of my favourite artists. His name, um, well, he is my favourite artist, John Howe, who worked uh, uh, for the Lord of the Rings series, along with Alan Lee. And having all these great artists from Weta, you name it, people around the world, 
critiquing your work, giving feedback and so forth. That's why this is such a great site. So as you can tell, there's four rankings. You've got your debut, your player, your contender. And then once you've achieved your goal and got to that um, employ employable um, badge of rookie, that's that's when you know you're successful. And through that success, um, the rewards come through the, uh, the rookies awards, such as getting uh, a chance to get a job. And there's so many um, jobs up for grabs and it happens every single year. So with that said, make sure to go check out the rookies award. Um, sign up to the website, take part, get involved, share your portfolio because at the end of the day, the only way to grow is to try and get yourself out there, get involved and most importantly, just have fun. And with that said, let's get straight into the podcast. Uh, hello everyone and welcome to the Shoot Art Podcast. I'm your host Ross Baxter and today is episode 54 of the series. The Shoot Art Podcast is a weekly series where I bring on guests from the film and game industries to talk about their journey and thoughts on student education. The Student Art Podcast is sponsored by the Rookies Award. It's open to young creatives in visual effects, animation, games, virtual reality, motion graphics, and last but not least, also 3D visualization. There's no simple way to get better. And there's no simply... Wait, I'm not even saying this right. There's simply no better way to launch your career and start sharing your amazing work online. Make sure to give the Rookies Award a follow. As always, the links are in the description below. Today on the podcast, we have a great guest for you. We have technical artist Justin Dolan on the show. How you doing, man? Thank you so much for coming on. Hello. Awesome. Um, th no, but thank you so much for coming on. Uh, Justin's also a really good friend of mine, so it's great to have him on. Uh, he has so much uh, knowledge, so much experience, and there's so much things we can talk about today uh, about his journey and also his thoughts at uni and so forth, and uh, we'll see what we can do. So, um, as always, man, um, we all start off with just introductions, so just uh, tell us a wee bit about yourself, what you do, and uh, I guess what got you into art. Well, uh, my name is Justin, as we've already discussed. Um... In school, I always had a passion for games and wanted to just figure out how they were made to the point where I ended up just specializing in that towards the end of my high school career and then moving into uh, 3D animation and design in college and then into games, into university, and here I am now. Perfect. So, like, uh, when it came to, like, <laughs> uh, the whole sort of... Um idea of art and stuff especially technical art so obviously the main thing for um, bringing uh, Justin on the show is um, he he knows so much he has he's literally I was just saying to him before the podcast he's probably one of the smartest people I know and like today when you're listening guys you're going to learn so much from him and um, so when it comes to like technical art what was like the main kind of um, I guess reason for going down technical art because I know obviously you come from like skills of many trades so environment art rigging, you name it, you pretty much know it, man. It'll be great to kind of hear uh, what got you into technical art. Well, I mean, when we worked together before in uni, yeah. uh, I, I was just an environment artist and then slowly became more of a technical focused person due to the number of skills. Mm -hmm. And then with that, I basically denied that I was a technical artist all the way up till I finished university, went into master's and was like, right, well, I guess there's no other choice but to do it. Yeah. So, so that's how I basically moved into the technical art field and then since then i've been specializing more towards what's required of that job perfect well actually like speaking of like the technical art role like what do you think um what's the main thing it entails like what what kind of defines a technical artist um like what's your thoughts on just technical art as a whole like if there's something like you, you if you had to like say to a student maybe like what's the best things to learn is there anything that kind of comes to mind um well, I, I speak to a few other technical artists, and the, the common theme that you'll find throughout is tool development to enable artists to push their work further. So instead of you making stuff from scratch like other environment artists and that, you're there to help enhance them and make sure they're producing the best work they can by, give it, by developing tools that will prevent them having to figure things out on their own that they might not know. Um, as well as you sitting there to help optimize and make things just look a little bit nicer and get closer to what's the original vision of the game is. Yep. That's that's what I think technical art's about. You helping other artists become the best they can. Perfect. Because they came. I remember obviously, obviously we were just saying there like uh, me and Justin worked together uh, when we were at uni. We also worked on a project um, with Disney, and it was through this project we were able to kind of kind of develop a good early understanding of how things worked and um, especially obviously my main, focal, my, uh, my main focal point being environment art if I struggled with something technically um, I would go to Justin and Justin would explain the process in regards to how actually pipeline actually works and like obviously like we were just discussing there like tools are like at the end of the day like, they're so important it's what keeps things structured it gives it structure 
Um, like when it comes to the tool side of things, man, or like the software, etc. What kind of things um, have you been working in and using? What's your kind of go-to for uh, just your learning? Um, for learning, it's just the usual what everyone else does: YouTube tutorials and Python code tutorials and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I do prefer to self-learn and figure things out my own, so I just sit there and experiment with everything constantly until yeah. I figure things out, and then I go and look up more research to see if I'm right or wrong. Mm-hmm. That's generally how I've been learning myself, which lets me go a little bit quicker, I think, because I'm not sitting there watching a you know an hour-long tutorial for the five minutes of knowledge it might give you in some cases, whereas other ones might be five minutes long, give you an hour's worth of knowledge. Yeah, no, that's a great that's a great point because like that's the one thing I probably um, obviously. Uh, noticed a lot when it came to like just watching how you did your work and stuff in in, in university because uh, I had a habit of obviously like you know me I purely just like I make 3D just because like I love 3D as simple as that and but the one my biggest weakness was I guess when I was studying was well I wouldn't say it was a weakness but like I did branch out a lot but the one thing I always respected about what you did is that you always were trying different things and it was like a habit it was like you just loved the craft purely because of the craft and like the create and obviously wanted to learn and yeah. it was this experiment thing that you said there that goes such a long way and it, that obviously helped you develop and um, like when it came to like experimenting stuff because obviously your art station has like so many different things you've got your your mechanical hand rig you've got your octopus rig you've even got exploration into rainfall and hologram shaders etc like there's so many different things going on there and um, but in terms of all your personal work is has there been like a personal favorite that you enjoy the most um through the technical stuff like what do you kind of enjoy the most out of that it's it's the robotic and mechanical rigging, I think. Uh, robotics is something I've always loved and always want to produce more. Mm-hmm. And unlike a lot of other robot stuff you see, there's very little, uh, I'd say, realism in it. Like, you don't know, you can't see the internals of things moving. It's just a big flat plane that moves. Mm-hmm. Whereas I like to get into the nitty gritty and develop all the pistons and gears and servos and stuff inside that do all that movement. And I yeah. think that's the most enjoyable part for my stuff. No, that's awesome. Cause like well, that's the thing is like your your mechanical hand was so cool like when you posted it, I was like, damn, just has done it again. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was just the fact that he's like there's like so many things going on. I'm just like, how on earth does he know these things? It's like, like you literally just think like, you're you're one of those people. This is why because I, I used to have this habit, but then I realized that like, I was like, screw it, I'm just gonna live with the ZBrush for for the rest of my life. Um, but you're one of those people that's like, right, I'm doing the whole thing, uh, no matter what, I'm doing the whole thing, and then you just see like do it step by step, and it's. Just, it's great seeing like the breakdown and how you think and like when it comes to like the rigging aspect and stuff it's i guess it's like the range that you cover and like that's another thing people like everyone who's tuning in when it comes to truly um like when it comes to just overall learning the only way to learn is properly challenging yourself and like trying things that you don't expect um giving things a try waiting to them uh, wait for them to fail and then you grow from that and um on justin's art stations so oh i, I even forgot everyone who's tuning in the main thing go give uh, justin a follow on his social media so justin's pretty much i'm sh- pretty sure dude you're on everything you're on like art station twitter um is there anything else you're on um no that's it really um yeah, that's your main go-to's yeah perfect so um before we continue just make sure to go uh, spam the follow button all the links will be in the description below so it'll be his twitter his art station so make sure to take advantage of that and uh check out the man's work because he makes some really good work and uh carry on with the conversation so when it comes to i guess the learning side of things there's actually one thing that you raised earlier about the master's degree but before we get into that i was just wondering is there anything that you wish from a technical um perspective you learned whilst you were at uni uh, have you ever like to go down like have you had to learn more about technical artists role um i mean the thing with our uni is we we went we were allowed to specialize pretty yeah. early in what we wanted to do yeah so i find that the problem there was that everyone was really good at the thing they wanted to do and didn't really know the bookends i would say of their stuff so if you you know a modeler was really good at modeling but they may not be as good at rigging or you know the other side of design stuff mm-hmm and I feel like just a bit more broad knowledge on that would make things a lot better. Okay. Because um, it's good to understand like where you're passing your model off to if you're modeling, or if you're pa- where 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 your anim- where your rig's going if you're passing it off to an animator. Like you know a little bit about what they do, so then you can understand better about what you should be doing to help enable them. Yeah, that's the thing. Whoa, I've just realised that's never been raised in the podcast. Thank you so much for saying that, man. Because it's like, it's it's so obvious. It's, <coughs> it's the um, it's, it's the thing is like there's so much things in the pipeline that we have to obviously realize and appreciate 
and like obviously you've got you start off um, like you said you've got your modelers etc you've got your texture artists you've got your riggers and you have to think about like say if you're making a model like take justin's uh, robotic hand if i was modeling it and not thinking about the rigging aspects and like for him to go then through the skin uh, skin weighting etc and going through that whole process for animation then the whole the whole sort of pipeline would just fall and break and it's getting that make sure like that functionality is there and that the prop that you're working uh, on has uh, has a purpose and serves its purpose well because at the day um, like for example when we're in the Disney project um, Justin obviously you can tell there's uh, like sometimes you were being like a bottleneck so you had to work so hard um, um, in certain scenarios because none of us were aware of how the pipelines worked if that makes sense at the time yeah yeah it was a big learning experience for everyone yeah definitely like it, it adds up because it was it's just the like everyone obviously has to learn different things and uh, it only comes through those experiences and um we were all just uh <coughs> I, I guess learning the pipeline and seeing what we could achieve but um carrying on um so when it came to a uh, university and stuff uh do you feel um like obviously my perspective i like i like i loved Alberta, i think it was great but did university teach you how to be ready for the industry and if not is there anything you think a uh, university could have done to make it better for you well, I'd say bring up as you were allowed to specialize in what you want. Um, people people did focus quite heavily on what they wanted to do, so they they were basically ready for the part they want to do. But with me, I was more as you say general and technical. I was not really specialized in anything. Yeah. I was quite I was quite broad in all my skill set. So for me, it was a little bit more difficult to figure out what I wanted to do and what I wanted to be initially. Mm-hmm. Until I realized, like, yeah, no, it seems like technical art is is what I was doing, even though I denied it for the longest of time. Yeah. No, I, I completely get you, man, because it's, it's, it's the hardest thing as well. It's like there's so many people, um, like, for example, there might be a lot of people tuning in right now who are thinking about <coughs> um, thinking about what kind of role to go down, whether it's um, uh, rigging, whether it's concept art. Like, there's so many different things. But that's also the hardest question for a lot of people. It's the question of, well, I actually enjoy a lot of things. What one do I choose? And I think the great thing uh, why technical art is a perfect role for you is simply because of... Like you know so much, and it's it it just makes sense for you. If you know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, perfect. Um, so if you were to say for obviously, um, uh, when it comes to technical art and stuff, like there's so many different softwares and stuff. Is there any like softwares that you recommend people to learn or like go to? Like obviously you were saying about scripting and stuff. It's nice to have a bit of a taster of that. Is there anything yeah. else that you kind of recommend or, um, even if it's not recommend, but just talk about? It'd be cool to hear. Well, from my talk with other artists it's the big things that are now there are uh, python tool development as well as shader development so learning shader graph and unity or unreal and uh, python development for like max and maya are the two biggest things i'd say that'd be looking for and then again you have to like know a bit of everything like you have to be able to sit, sit down and solve a, a multitude of different problems that might appear during the development mm-hmm. of stuff so like you yeah, it's, it's hard because like they're the, they're the core focuses, and then you basically have to be able to say, hey, do you need that fixed, and then fix it for them yeah. with, a, with a proposal of what could be done to fix it. Do you, do you think there's uh, anything that stands out that like, your common artist doesn't realise? Um, like, do you think there's anything that stands out that maybe an artist doesn't know of that technical artists um, want them to be aware of, if you know what I mean? So, like, obviously, like there's certain pipelines that um, you guys obviously need us to do, if you know what I mean. Like, is there anything that kind of stands out that makes your job easier? And uh, it's all about communication. It's like if 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 we're going to develop a tool, it'd be good to get as much as much description about what that tool is to do, mm-hmm. and like really be solid in what you want it to do, as opposed to getting it and then saying it's not right, and then send it back and so on and so on until it's until it's correct. Yeah. It's all it's all about communication at the end of the day in these things. So I mean that's the big skill. Like that's the thing. So when it comes to um, uh, for example, when we were working on the Disney project, so just to give people a bit of uh, more because um, we're we're allowed to talk about this, so this is fine. So uh, Justin and I worked on um, how could you say it? a VR? Um, you're probably better at describing this uh, than me, man. It was a del- 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 developmental research brief uh, to help show the new developments that Disney had created in their lightweight rendering system that allowed us to have basically VR video. Mm -hmm. And so 
we were tasked with creating a scene that would be created in film using Maya to then show this technology off to the best of it, our abilities at the time. Yeah, because like, like that was um, like this was a, an amazing project for us to take, and uh, we were fortunate enough to take this uh, project during our time at university. And um, when we were working on this project, uh, like I said earlier, there were so many different things that we had to learn in terms of the pipeline. And when it comes to Justin, obviously like, there's different things technically that he had to obviously um, focus on uh, in relation to the pipeline. Uh, like one of the things that he was uh, introduced into was like particle systems for grass and weeds. And then he had to also like adapt things from the X, X Frog library uh, for use to work in the scene. And he was also the environment artist uh, for the exterior stuff. And like during this, uh, I'm not sure if there's any main things maybe you'd uh, like to talk about that you that you learnt uh, from that project. Is there anything that can just st- like stood out for you? Um, I think it was a teaching of software because that I also like showed everyone how to use RenderMan oh, from yeah, our yeah, initial because yeah, yeah. we were taught yeah. we were we were taught it and then the ta- what we were taught was an outdated version. So I sat down and relearned it in the new tech so we can so I can then pass that on, and I also showed the Substance Painter to the people that hadn't used it before. Mm-hmm. Because at that time, it was only me and you that used it. Yep. So it was showing that off to other people and making sure they knew and understood how to how to use that. So I think that was the new thing for me at that project, was learning how to teach other softwares to other people. Perfect. Yeah, because uh, obviously like what you were saying earlier, <coughs> uh, what you were saying earlier was all about the, the, cu- the communication aspect. And like that was the thing. Like It was the first time like, that we ever had like a taster. Well, it was certainly my uh, first time anyway. Like of really trying to kind of like stick to deadlines and learn time management and understand that um you c- couldn't be so precious even though like you know me I'm I'm way OCD but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm learning I've improved um and I learned a lot from that project it was it was nice working the team because there's so many different things that um that we were all un- unaware of that we had to do in order to make like our our colleague uh, work more efficiently or how to like work better if you know what I mean. So there was a lot of different things that uh, we tackled on that Disney project. So if you guys are tuning in and you're wondering what the Disney project that we're talking about, so uh, I'll put the link in the description. And uh, it was actually for Ziggraph, so it was a really awesome experience that we had the opportunity to to, to work on. So make sure to check that out. So um, as always, man, um, one of the main questions I like to ask is what were the benefits of going to university for you? Uh, you can... T- so learning is a lot easier now for game development than it used to be back like early 2000s and 90s and stuff mm-hmm. um but there's still a lot of things that university shows you that you can't learn through youtube tutorials or video tutorials or anything like that yeah one of these things being like working in a team uh more of the production aspects and more of like the it also helps tailor your learning to fit what you want to do better mm-hmm. i think the I think when you're going to learn by yourself the intimidation is, is like you you need to learn everything is what most people think and at the end of the day it's just not the case you only need to learn what you need for your task that you want to do so a modeler needs to know how to model and like unwrap and then maybe texture a little bit but that's that's generally it they don't need to learn how to rig and then animate and then put in tech game engine and stuff like that it's a lot of back and forth and i think the university helps you figure that out a little bit easier do, do you do you think there's enough um like what's your your concept on the or what's your thoughts on the balance between the whole the, the whole sort of written side versus the the actual practical thing like what's your kind of uh, interpretation of that practical is always going to be more fun than written but uh writing is is important so you can tailor so you can learn how to research better i think because mm-hmm. tech art is all about research and development like it's we're the R&D guys for art pipeline work and stuff. Yeah. And so we, we are always researching and developing new techniques. And then documentation is a massive part of that. Like, if we make a tool, there'll always be a document to accompany it, usually, to help you figure it out and make it easy for you to play. And we wouldn't know how to do that without writing it down and stuff. Like, when you're doing your research, so going back to your, um, your portfolio, so... Uh, one of your recent posts was uh, the rainfall experiment with the textures and stuff, and then also like your hologram, hologram shaders. Yep. Um, so what was the kind of main uh, reason for this um, task? Was it purely just out of pleasure, like just to try something different, or was there a concept, <coughs> um, or was there like a certain goal in mind? Um, well, these were these were designed to our, for my folio to show more technical art stuff, mm-hmm. but the nature of the theme of each of them was purely due to 
stuff that I'd done in my past. So like my honors project was a VR project that I wanted to be in a rainy scene, mm-hmm. but with it being VR, I couldn't have as many particles as I wanted. So, you know, two years later, I designed this shader that would allow me to have that effect without having to have particles. So that was the idea of using that to create these shaders. Um, like, so you, a lot, how, oh, on you go. A lot of my shader, a lot of the stuff that I develop and put in my folio is research from stuff that I've struggled with in the past and learned how to change and do later on, and then that's how it's come to be inside there. Perfect. So, like, just speaking of like the hologram shader and stuff, like, I was like, I, I guarantee you, you're, you're, you're gonna have an, like a simple expl- explanation how you did it because I just, I just know how you think it. <laughs> so tell me how you did it because I have no idea how you did it. It'd be great to, to know how you um, made it. Well, these were done in Unreal, not Unreal, Unity, mm-hmm. um, and they're just they're just shader nodes. So it's a lot of different things. So with the 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 rain fell effect, it's blending two normal maps, one being an animated tile sheet and the other being just the regular normal map of the texture, and that allows me to, and I have controls and functions in there that allow you to move things back and forth to create and tailor it the way you wish. Yeah. Um. So it's it's just a big node setup that makes me cry when I look at it now because <laughs> it's so big. Yeah. So much stuff going on, because like, like, that's the thing is like when I saw it, because um, I saw your breakdown as well um, uh, on ArtStation and how, like your thought process, and then I checked the video as well to see uh, to see actually live and actually working like in the actual engine. And I was just like, how on earth has Justin made this? I don't have a clue. Like I'm still learning that kind of aspect, and I really want to kind of uh, dive more, uh, like dive deeper into that sort of area because it'd be great to kind of make. Um, like obviously you'll know yourself when it comes to making environment art and stuff, but to really make it feel alive and like when you see like for example fly fly throughs and stuff, having that sort of physics in the engine and stuff just makes it come alive. Yeah, a lot little lot, lot, little movements and details make things just look more realistic. Yeah, it's it's way more fun. It's like, it just it looks so cool. It's like you just see the drips and I'm like that's so awesome. <laughs> it's it's the small things that go a long way. Um, so obviously when it comes to um. Uh, the education side of things and um, you were talking earlier about the master's degree and um, so obviously um, there's so many different people studying so many different things and one of the questions they obviously have to ask themselves is what do they want to do once they finish fourth year and some people obviously maybe are in a situation of which they're like right maybe I don't have the skills yet to do what I want to do maybe I'm still quite not sure what I want to do and um, so you went down the master's route and um, I was just wondering what's your thoughts on just um, do you recommend doing masters, um, or like, what's your whole, um, what's your so-called thoughts on them? It's really a question of uh, why. Why do you want to do a masters if you're going to do a masters? For me, it was like um, I was still unsure about what I wanted to do, so I used that to then solidify my choice, which is why I'm more technical now. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the end of the day, it is asking yourself why. Why do you want, or why do you need to do the masters as opposed to just looking for a job and getting that. Um, Everyone will have a different answer, I think. Yeah. It, it all comes down to why and how. So, so like, when it came to the Masters, because um, I, I, that's the one thing. So, uh, for me, like, for my path, it was always kind of, uh, like, I just wanted to get my degree and then focus on um, just doing environment art and just doing my thing. And uh, the Masters, um, I did I did think about doing it at one point. Like, I was considering it. It did, it did pop up. But, like... Like if you were to maybe um like I know in the masters like you properly specialize uh, like you were saying, but if there's um for example people who are tuning in right now, uh, when it comes to lectures and stuff, um how would you say to improve the masters? Is there anything you'd uh, recommend to make the masters more, uh, successful? Albert T's one's pretty successful right now. The last class I was part of was a seventy three strong, right? Which is quite whoa, right. which is yeah, it's massive for a class size because yeah. that was like. That's almost the same size as my year at undergrad. Yeah. Um. So I think. I think the thing with the masters that I did was much more about acting professional as opposed to research. Okay. So, it was more working in a team. So every project was a team project. Very few or very few subjects or modules were solo modules. So it was all all designed to like work together as a studio type deal. Mm-hmm. And I think just taking a step away from that and allowing people to just develop their core skill a bit more yeah as a is a little bit that's what i would say to add to improve it because teamwork teamwork is great um but sometimes people get overwhelmed especially if you're working on two or three teams a module it's a little bit more difficult uh, what do you mean like as in like when you mean the core do you mean just like the core uh like principles of just like like what, yeah no what, what do you mean? just instead like so every module i did was a team team module 
every apart from like the so, the ones that you chose, every other module was a, a team module. And I think just taking a step back from having two teams per mo- per semester and going to like one team and then having another class that's designed to really help you specialize and focus on the research that you're doing mm-hmm. would be a good way to go. Perfect. Yeah, because like uh, when it came to like the whole concept of the whole masters for me. Um, I generally felt like because I didn't I didn't read into it as in like I didn't uh, look into like how like the modules were set up. I naturally just thought it'd basically be right if you say for example for me or, um, or for you like say um, you're a technical artist purely just focus on technical art for a year and uh, master like um, the research behind technical art and what it does and what it offers etc. But um, the fact that it's branched out to the group thing, I guess like that's like the healthy balance is also what yeah. you're saying. It's it gives you that kind of balance between learning what to, uh, to expect the industry to be like in terms of working in teams um, I'm pretty sure obviously Albert a also reached out to studios as well for that for the, for the group project yeah they all they all they bring in they bring in studios from the surrounding area and some other bigger ones as as you progress through the masters and you get to speak to these people multiple times during the year mm-hmm. and they'll always give you some great insight into what to do next or what you could do to help improve your work and stuff I might correct the 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 fourth year they got in, uh, not fourth year the masters they reached out to like four J studios. Or yeah, so from the for the past few years they've been reaching out for four J. So three three of the guys from my masters, three. Yeah, three people from my masters was were interning at at the studio at the time, and then one of them is now a permanent employee of the studio. Perfect. Yeah, because um, like that was that was one of the things I wasn't sure because uh, I was talking to one of the. Uh, um, an audio, um, one of the guys who does audio at 4J Studios on the podcast. Mike uh, Graham? Yeah, Mike, really, <laughs> really, really awesome person. Can't, can't go wrong with Mike. I know Mike. Yeah, he's such a, he's, he's such a, he's such a nice guy. Uh, it was super cool talking to him. And like, he was telling me about his experience with the Masters and uh, how they connected up with 4J Studios. And like, that's the thing, it's like when it comes to universities, the one thing that I would love to see, like I know a lot of people are doing it or a lot of places are doing it, like spe- especially Staffordshire University, so they obviously branch out and reach out to um, people in the industry. I know obviously for example, uh, Aberté, uh, I'm not sure if they still do it. Are they still reaching out to Axis? Um, I, I can't say. Yeah. Like, uh, I, I do not know. I'm, I'm, I got a feeling like uh, so when I was in um, Aberté, they would reach out to Axis Animation and uh, offer like a mentoring uh, a mentorship scheme and yeah. basically the students would have the chance to get mentored by access to kind of get that sort of hands-on experience but uh, no thanks thank you so much for going into depth about that because it was it was the master's one thing that uh, there's one thing that's the one thing i've never talked about on the podcast and uh, it's, it's always been a important aspects because sometimes people just don't know what they want to do yeah um, right, so this is going to be a fun one because this is one thing you helped me out <laughs> literally most of the, my, most of my time at uni. Right, what's your thoughts on computer specs and stuff, and what would your what's your recommendation in terms of what people should learn when it comes to the, just the core basics? Because you know me, I'm a noob at computers, so when I, when I need help, I can just go to Justin. So, is there anything that kind of stands out to you that would actually just basic stuff? I know it's um, a bit of a random one, but I found out. Well, I was just thinking it's actually an important question to ask you because like how much you helped me out in university computer specs wise it's all about understanding what you have and then building for that as opposed to trying to go over vicious because if you'd say you've got you know eight gigs of ram and a, a gtx 1060 you know you've not got a tremendous amount of power you've got a lot of power still but like it's not as much as some other computers so mm-hmm. always build always keep within your specs list i'd say if you push things too far you'll end up with a lot more lag slowdowns and waiting around which for a creative, it's very, very time-consuming. I assume you've been in many situations where waiting for something to just change yep. is giving you driving you up the wall half the time. Oh, oh, definitely, man. Like the the amount of times, <laughs> the amount of times Justin saved me in uni was unreal. Like, I, I, there's got to be at least five situations that you, you fixed my computer, you helped me get a deadline because there was like a like remember the whole situation with the RAM and oh, man. <laughs> the ssd and you name it everything i was like right just then my whole computer's dying <laughs> everything's like going so slow and then he was like right ross learn how to uh, function ram so you'd, you'd come <laughs> over explain how ram worked and i was like right i'm finally learning the basics basics after what because yeah, you'd have what two U versions of unreal open along with like four <laughs> versions of maya and like yep just breaking the computer going crazy just, like you need more ram if you're going to try that out <laughs> 
you just have me like, like just as like this guy has no common sense <laughs> and then if you add in polygon cap so i was working on a task with edinburgh university a few last uh, end of last year yeah and uh, they'd sent me a photo scan model to retopologize. right and that model was you know 32 million polygons whoa right okay so you know, to retopologize that, like that used all thirty-two gigabytes of RAM I have on my machine. Yeah. So like, Damn. I was waiting minutes for things to switch to the retopology system, and then back, and then you know. So it's like, yeah, always, always try and keep within your limits about what you have. I'd say. Yeah. Um, just I would, if you want to go more ambitious, push it slowly. Don't go crazy really quickly. Mhm. And that's that's my suggestion for it. Just yeah. So, but th- what that also does though, is it also lets you figure out how to optimize efficiently. Mm-hmm. If you're on a lower spec computer, you know you have to optimize better, which makes you better in the end, long run for doing optimization work for games. Perfect. Now, because like this is a question I've been waiting to to ask you, because it's one thing that I think uh, people. Um, I I don't know if it's just because I forgot, or some people forget, but it's like it's the tools, it's the knowledge, and it's the thing that helps your day to day needs just run smoothly. And like when it comes to like the RAM, the graphics card and stuff. Um, so for example, take um three D artists who are just starting out, um, or technical artists and stuff. Is there a sort of like, um, just a basic setup you'd recommend in terms of like, because like, all you need, I guess, is eight gigs, like or no, you, sixteen you gigabytes. To... Sixteen gigabytes now, I'd say, is good for three D artists. Okay. Um, just so you have that additional thing. If you look at games nowadays, they're starting to demand eight gigs is the minimum minimum specs. Mm-hmm. For a computer, so I always go, you know, a little bit higher than that. So I recommend 16 gigabytes at the least yep. for, for 3D art. And with RAM getting cheaper as we go, it's a little bit easier to get that much. So what would you say for graphics card? Uh, at least 1060, something with six gigabytes, just to have a bit of grunt. You can go with thing. My first, my first computer that I did 3D art on had a two gigabytes graphics card, and back then that was the, that was the best you can get, you know. Yeah. But now it's getting so much faster. You know, you get cards with eight gigabytes and twelve gigabytes, and you're like, "Whoa, wait a minute, we've <laughs> gone, we've gone to the future." <laughs> awesome. Uh, <coughs> and then I guess, uh, like, do you think SSD is something that you'd recommend uh, to all students, or do you think that's not a necessity yet? Um, it depends on the program. I I have all my programs on a regular hard drive, and you know, giving myself that lets me give like my myself a quick breather of like, right, I could think about what I'm doing next. Mm-hmm. An SSD, of course, will load everything up faster, but then sometimes you just, you know, if you load up a bunch of things real quick, you're like, oh, it's all too quick. You know, you're not had time to think about what you're going to actually do. Yeah. Um, SSD is great. I put Windows on it, you know, just so you can, if you, you know, when you turn your computer on, it doesn't take a long time. But when you get into it, like, put your core programs on your SSD and then all the rest to another hard drive, I'd say. Perfect. Um, and... Uh... Before we move on to the next uh, kind of question, is there anything else um, that you've realized over the years when it comes to the computer uh, and just computer parts? Is there anything else that you would add maybe to to that list to make um, things just more easier in general? Or do you think is that's like the core principle, just get that done and you'll be fine? Yeah, I think, yeah, like, again, it's budget always resides. Try and get the best you can for what you can. Um I've always said don't focus on the visual looks of a piece. I've seen people with windowed cases and they have to make sure every single part has the same color scheme and it really just, it's like you're choosing aesthetics over performance for me. Yep. And at the end of the day, performance is the king in this, this space, isn't it? You yep. know, there's well, no point going for a less graphics card just because it looks cooler. That, that's a, that's, that's a, good, a great word to, uh, to bring up. I, I, I've never uh, really gone into depth about that. It's like the whole idea of performance and... Like when it comes to just like, uh, for example, just asset work, um, asset work and stuff, um, particularly when I was in uni, my main focus was obviously just trying to master, trying to get art looking uh, better quality. Not in terms of like actually working in game and stuff, but purely fo- focusing on developing my craft and stuff. But I never really went into depth about making things efficient. And um, when it comes to performance, is there anything that you kind of uh, that comes to mind for you that's like? maybe like a must that maybe people should start looking more into because i remember you said there about obviously like the polygons and stuff like work, working smart and stuff does anything else kind of stand out to you i mean it again it all comes down to what you're making at the time if you're going to be making a character you know think about 
what level of graphics should we have for your character? Think about what game he's going to be put in. If you're making a game for like a, if you're making a character for like a triple A game, mm-hmm. you know it's okay to be around sixty thousand or a hundred thousand polygons because that's what characters are these days. God of War, Thanos was a hundred thousand, around about a hundred thousand polygons. Yeah. And uh, the one of the lead artists of uh, Insomniac Spider Man has just revealed that like that that Spider Man model is like around the eighty five thousand polygons. Yeah. But if you're modeling for a lower a mobile game or something like that, you gotta really keep an eye on those polygon counts because the car the phones can't put that much into it. They've not got dedicated systems that are designed for that. Mm-hmm. Um, we're starting to see that a little bit with you know the Razer phone and the ROG phone. They're starting to be more gaming oriented, but it's still gonna take a while for that to pick up. Mm-hmm. Like, um, yeah. No, that, that's that's perfect because um, like that. Ex- so much stuff um like you said there like I, like I've never been aware of or I've like obviously like, I know like I, I feel like I'm comfortable with a lot of things but when it comes uh diving deep more about the sort of performance area and trying to, <coughs> and trying to be more smart I, I really need to kind of um dive deeper into that and learning more about just working efficiently um, and yeah. so on the podcast uh, the one thing I always like to talk about is uh, the learning aspect in terms of online courses and stuff and obviously when it comes down to the technical content, uh, well, not technical content, uh, technical art role. Um, is there anything that kind of um, stands out to you as in a great source of, uh, obviously you got your YouTube and that, but is there any maybe YouTubers, uh, like people you'd uh, recommend to subscribe to or any like forums that's with poly count, um, anything kind of come to mind? No, I, I'm not really one to like dedicate myself to a specific learning platform. I'll, I'll generally, if I know what I want to try and figure out, I'll just Google that. Mm-hmm. and look through the results and pick the one that I think looks the best. Right. And half the time it turns out to be okay, other half the time it's like, no, this is terrible, and I'm going to find another one. Mm-hmm. Um, for Python, uh, I'd recommend a guy called Zubrick. Zubrick, right, okay. Yeah, because he, he's done great small Python tutorials that I, I sat down and used to learn my Python, and he does it in a way that's so digestible and so easy to get that I was able to develop a tool after only watching his, basically his introductory course. Wow, right. Yeah. Like, so that uh, for like Python is a core a core skill that I think every tech artist needs. Um, you have to be able to like make a maybe it's a specific exporter or, or a function in Maya that will let you do one thing or the other. Mm-hmm. Um, just to speed up performance. I'm sure you've had a point where you're like you've been doing something repetitive for so long that you just want a tool to do it all for you. Yeah. And um, and that's what Python art, that's what a technical artist can sometimes do is create that tool for you. Definitely, because. I guess I, um, most of the best way to describe it is this: is like, well, you nailed it there perfectly. Um, especially when it comes to modeling, obviously modeling's my obsession. <laughs> I just model all the time, twenty four seven, and it's like trying to figure out the shortcuts, the short keys, and or maybe a script, kind of I don't know, a script that does one thousand pipes, uh, or like, I, I don't know. But well, that's the thing. That's the hardest thing with me though. Is like I I really struggle with uh, with generated things because I'm just like I have to make everything, especially the model. Like I'm just like. I need to model every single detail, even every rivet, no matter what. Everything has to be done. <laughs> why, why are you modeling rivets? They're normal, they're normal map things. Remember when we were talking about performance? <laughs> normal maps are massive. See, I'm the biggest culprit of this. This is why This is why it's important to bring Justin on the show. <laughs> Substance has some terrific hard surface tools that let you do rivets does. on one click, and it's gorgeous. That's the thing. I need to just start, um, I guess, just stop being so <laughs> OCD with my modeling. Like um, I was streaming last night and I was just like modeling every single thing and I'm loving every second of it. <laughs> yeah, but like, again, like if you look at your model and you realize if it's a really small and really nonchalant, like a rivet, yeah. you know, that could be a model texture stuff. Of course. You don't need to model that. So that would save you time. And I would say a ton of effort because like if you're doing a big, you know, metal plate with like 150 rivets, that's a lot of models to place. Yeah. Whereas in a texture, you can like create a brush that you just stroke once and you've made all those in one go. I, I can't disagree. <laughs> D- damn it, Justin. <laughs> I've been caught. <laughs> um, so carrying on with the same question. Um, so this is like the kind of the difficult question that I ask on the podcast. But like, then again, sometimes it's quite straightforward as well. But if you had a, ch- uh, a choice, though, um, to actually make a decision between uni versus online, would you go down one route if you had to choose? I'd stick with uni. Okay. Oh, that's um, that's great to hear. Perfect. Right. Just okay. just the core the core skill of it all just gives you that more sense and more direction. Whereas 
going online, you don't really, as I'm saying, you don't really have that direction. So it's left up to you. And sometimes you might do the wrong thing. Sometimes you might do the right thing. And most of the time, you'll just be doing a bit of everything. Mm-hmm. Whereas uni lets you really focus and figure out what you want to do a lot quicker. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Because uh, like, that's the thing is that, like, the one thing that I realize so many artists struggle uh, doing is uh, doing art without a deadline or having some sort of person to kind of push them forward. Yeah, uh, exactly. Like when we were in uni, um, like this wasn't like this was never a problem for me. I'm not sure what it was like for you, but well, I think and I know what you're like. Like I know you love doing 3D, so you were like up through the night just like learning different things. But um, obviously you'd see like so many people who'd be like just struggling to get any work done at home. Yeah, and like you'd just be wondering like, right, that person's des- uh, definitely needs the needs the student life. They need to um, have the guidance. They need that support. They need yep. to be surrounded by people that they want to be surrounded by. Like that was the thing. Like when I was in uh, uni with Justin, like we'd just be geeking out about three D because it was just that's what we love to do, and it just made it so much easier. Right, man. So the fun part of the podcast. So this is called five hundred seconds. Okay. Yep. So we've got five hundred seconds, uh, give or take. We'll see how we'll see how the questions flow. They, it might be. So we've got about eight questions. Um, there's a there's no rule. To, well, there's only one rule. Um, if you feel like you want to pass, you can just say pass. Um, if you don't, if you maybe you don't have an answer, or you don't want to answer the question. It's not a problem at all. Yeah, yeah. So don't feel stressed to uh, to answer any of them. Uh, so as always, folks, if you're uh, unaware, so five hundred seconds is just like a fun section of the podcast where I ask uh, a bunch of random questions to the guests. Um, from games you name it to anything uh so are you ready man yeah okay so we'll start off with uh we'll start off with this favorite tv show and why favorite tv show mash from the six, 60s 70s because it's a comedy show about a mobile army surgical hospital in the korean war and the characters are just the best part of that whole thing wait what's it called mash m-a-s-h oh right i've never heard of this and we have to check this out it's fantastic Wait, so say, say it again. So what's it about? Wait, It's about uh, uh, an army surgical hospital yep. that was uh, a few miles back from the front line in the Korean War Okay. in the 60s. Yep. And it's about them, you know, daily life on a military base, essentially, while also doing medical procedures here and there. Mm-hmm. And the banter between all the characters is the best part because Perfect. all the characters are variety and different and it just shows stuff and then it hits you with some emotional stuff here and there all the time as well yeah. whilst still being a comedic is, is it like a like a long a long show or like a... it's eight seasons oh wow, wow. right okay yeah it, it the last episode of it held the record for the most most viewed thing in one go right up until the 2015 super bowl right damn i don't have a clue i've never heard of this i'm gonna have to check it out yeah uh right so this one is an, another fun one uh what scares you the most I don't know failure, I'd say. <laughs> oh, that's that. That's similar to me, man. Like it's pretty much what I was like. I've the... always, I've always, if I say I'm going to do something, I've always got it done. I've never been to a point where I've failed to do it. And yep. That that feeling of what if I do fail at one point. Yep. Oh, that's a, no, that's a perfect answer, man. Because uh, uh, I'm re- I'm really glad you brought that up because uh, I actually so if anyone are aware of this, so my honors project was called the fear of failure. Um. So. Th- like I'm, I'm, I'm all. I'm, uh, how can I say? It? I'm over it now. Uh, I've, <laughs> I was like stumbling over my words. I was trying to figure out how to say this. <laughs> uh, but it was the one thing that I kind of struggled with as well. And uh, no, I'm really happy you said that because there's a lot of artists who, um, I guess, have so many ambitions and stuff, or so much drive, and uh, sometimes um, you just have to realize that sometimes you just have to step back. If you know what I mean. Yeah. And uh, like you, you'll know yourself, man. Like we, we both uh, learn from our experiences and stuff. But uh, no, that's a that's a perfect answer. That's that's one I've not uh, been. Uh, no one said that yet, and uh, I don't even know why I didn't say that. I, 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 I've not <laughs> mentioned that one yet. It was literally like mine for like twenty years of my life. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, the, right. The fun one. Favorite game and why? Ubisoft Blue Byte Settlers Three. Oh my gosh! I've never heard of this. Explain. It came my... out in ninety five, ninety six ish time, but. Right. I remember sitting down with my brother many years ago mm-hmm. and playing this on an old IBM machine. Right. I'm going to uh, check this up. Wait, what's it called? Wait, say it again? Set- Settlers 3. Settlers 3. I've never it's, heard of this. It's an old town building game right. where you also train soldiers and people and was, the idea was to take over the whole map against other factions. And you were able to play as the Romans, the Asians, or the Egyptians. Mm-hmm. And it was just... So I still play that game today. 
That is awesome. No, that that looks so cool. It's like it reminds me of um, a wee bit of like civilization, sort of Master Olympus or Roma or like. Yeah, it's it's more closer to like older, more RTS games. So like Age of Empires and stuff like that. Yeah, oh, that's a great choice. But again. you have territory and stuff. Um, they're just about to launch a new one that they uh, they've announced for next year, and I'm very excited. What is it? Just like Settlers Four, or is it something? No, Settlers. This would be the eighth one. Oh. It were eighth, right? Okay. Yeah, it's a long series, and I've played almost all of them. Oh, oh, public. Oh, what's it called? And... There's um, there's a. Oh, I'm trying to figure out where it is. So a game came out. No, it was announced. You you you'll probably know what it is. So a game got announced this year. Um, was it this year or was it last year? It was um basically similar to Civilization. Mankind. Is it, oh, I don't think it was that. It was like based in France. Um, it was like um, kind of um, the eight. How can I say? Eighteen hundreds. Eighteen hundreds. Yeah. So it's Anno eighteen hundred. Yeah, that one. Yeah. That's, that's another. It's the... another favorite game of mine done oh. by the same studio. Um, that is very much a town building game. That is a, uh, you build a town, but the joy with that is you have to deal with logistics. Mm-hmm. So you, if you get your, you know, you get your first set of uh, settlers, and they require things like tea and rice. Right. And then you upgrade them, they then require more things. So you have to set up infrastructure for things like, you know, uh, bacon and beer. Mm-hmm. And up and up and up to the point where you get to the highest level. And you've got you've got all this industry behind your city and stuff. And it's it's fantastic. Um, and there's Anno 2070 that I've played, 2012, 5, 1800, 1440, 1600, 1602 are all games that I've played from that series. I, 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 like, I've never heard of it before until that came out and I was like, Dude, this is my type of game. Like, yeah, I, I can't wait to play that game. Like that, just the cinematic as well, like the trailer. Well, eighteen hundreds out. I've been playing it. Wait, is it out? I'm, what? Yeah, I've been playing it for months, man. Oh gosh, I'm so, like, I've, I have to stop working. I've just been <laughs> working too much. <laughs> oh god, wait, I'm gonna write that down so I don't forget that because I need to buy that. That was so good. Right. It's fantastic. I Ubisoft. Know, that's my goal. <laughs> yeah, that and check out the Settlers. Settlers is another fantastic game for me. Right, folks, you heard it, so you have to check out the games as well, because uh, I'm definitely... Dude, we have to play that together. Yeah. Uh, that looks so awesome. Right, uh, next one. If you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? Where I am now. All oh, right, well, that makes it easy then. <laughs> I'm not I'm not the biggest fan of changing. Um, I like I like to stay where I... Keep where I am and keep... As you know, I always went to the same desk in university. Yep. And stuff like that. I don't, I don't tremendously like a big changes. Yep, you like routine. But, but based on your know, job and stuff, I will move to the job if need be. Of course. No, that's a perfect answer. I completely, I, I see where you're coming from. Right, uh, this is going to be an interesting one because I have no idea what you're going to say. Who's your favourite artist? Favourite artist? Yeah, like, uh, you can say environment artist, character artist, you name it, uh, technical artist, whatever comes to mind. Who, what's, who's the best artist in your opinion? Or who's the, the style or something that you like, wow, I love that. That's a hard one. <laughs> I've put you on the spot, my friend. <laughs> Remember, you can pass if you don't know, or you can say a few, or a studio, maybe. Studio? I'd say Ghibli. It's all fantastic work. Nailed it. <laughs> like, Can't go wrong with Studio Ghibli. <laughs> some of the best animation work you'll ever see. Yeah. And a lot of it is still hand-done. Miyazaki, yeah. <laughs> Not just Miyazaki, even the other guy. Um, is it Soho, Sojo or someone? I can't remember, but... I prefer his work over some of the Miyazaki stuff. My right. favorite Ghibli, my favorite Ghibli film is Pom Poco, mm-hmm. which is such a weird one. <laughs> oh, I, I need. To, I, I'm still trying to get up to date with this whole sort of um, the trend and that. So I was talking to uh, um, one of my mentors on the podcast, Fraser McLean, and uh, he was talking to me for ages. We, we had like a Skype session. I'm pretty sure we talked about Miyazaki for at least an hour or two. <laughs> yeah. Uh, before, before we even got into the proper conversation, <laughs> it was just like non-stop talking about him. Right, uh, next one. Uh, favorite food? Curry. Curry, right? Okay. Curry's great. Um, there's so many choices, so many options, so many ways you can tailor it to be the perfect way you want it. It's it's like pizza for some people. Like yeah. you can't you can't you can't beat a curry for me. <laughs> like, what's your go-to curry? Or is, is there a certain sort of temperature? Like how? Like, no, is, are I'm, you a spicy person? Or? I'm a spice person. I I enjoy spicy food. Um, but I just like you know, classic UK Chinese curry sauce style yep. chicken curry it's great perfect um for an indian curry i'll go with a madras usually oh right okay like because like mine's always been a chinese like i can't i can't do the i can't uh, choose indian i don't know why it's like it's always a chinese 
just chicken curry and chips. I'm like, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, and katsu curry from Japan is great as well. I, I've got so much stuff to get up to date on this. So this podcast is like putting me to shame, man. <laughs> what have you done, Justin? <laughs> right, uh, this is the last one. This is a bit of a random one. If you could have any animal as a pet, what would you choose? And it could be, um, you can even go, it doesn't even have to be an animal. It could be like a dragon or something crazy because this, this was a fun one. Ants. Ants, right, okay. What, why ants? Like make them ants. your army. Ants are incredibly fascinating. They're they're the biggest social workers in the world. You know, they they outnumber humans a hundred to one at least. Mm -hmm. And the the stuff that they do is absolutely incredible. Um, they build houses. They take care of the young. They 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 war. They, it's, oh, it's it's fantastic. Just watching them work and do yeah. work is is the best part. Like that. Like that's the thing. Like, that's a really interesting answer. I did not expect that one because. Uh... There was this. Uh, well, I don't like the. I don't like what they did to do this, but I like also. But I liked the fact that I got to see it. So there was this um, massive, crazy ant farm, um, or whatever. It was massive. It was probably I don't know, twenty by twenty meters. It was insane. Just billions of them, just going crazy. And what they decided to do was to check the structure of it. They poured down some sort of. Um, I think it was concrete, maybe. Poured lead, maybe. Uh, I don't know. They poured something into it just to see, and then they br uh, broke it up, and then started um, brushing away the dirt and stuff. Yeah. And you got to see how crazy the structure was. Yeah, it's insane, is it? Oh, it's mental, and it's just well, obviously, yeah, I felt so bad for the ants and stuff, but it's just crazy, um, like how like intelligent they are, and like that's the thing as well. There's one thing I was reading about. I might have completely read the wrong thing, but am I r wrong in saying that ants don't sleep? I got a feeling I, they don't sleep. I, I might be It's hard wrong. to say. They they they'll rest at some point. Right. Whether it's sleeping or not, I don't know. But yeah. you know, they don't they don't you don't every nobody has constant energy that allows them to go forever. Yeah. Well, so yeah. everything everything one does need rest. Okay, well it's just like I'm sure there was something I read about that I, for some reason I got in my head that it's ants that don't sleep or like something that doesn't <coughs> sleep. But dolphins, uh, dolphins sleep half. Like half their brain sleeps, the other half stays awake. Right, okay, that's interesting. Um, and they alternate between that. Yeah, like damn. Because like, that's the thing is like when it comes to like all these like animals and in insects and stuff, it's like there's so many great things that like especially when it comes to car art, character artists and creature artists, like they they'll just be having a field day. It'll be awesome just doing what they do, because like they just have to like check out uh, different uh, animals and insects and see how like things react and stuff. Like that's why I always find um, like the sea so amazing. Like literally, like there's so many things happening in the ocean that we don't we don't even know like ten percent of it. Yep. Uh, thank you so much, uh, man, for coming on. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Um, as always, uh, everyone who's tuning in across all the platforms, make sure to check out his work uh, in the links below. And uh, thanks once again, man. It's been a pleasure. No problem. And we will see you guys in the next episode. Thanks and bye for now. <laughs>